My name is Christine Full, and I will be introducing Sovereign Health and our speaker today. First, a brief overview of Sovereign Health Group. We are a private behavioral health care organization offering adult male and female residential programs for addictions, dual diagnosis, primary mental health, and primary eating disorders. We are also known to offer blended programming, treating the combination of addictions, mental health, and eating disorder conditions. We are duly licensed and joint commission accredited, offering the highest quality of patient care. We accept and direct bill most PPO and HMO insurances. Please visit our website at www sovcal.com and I also will have information at the end pertaining to the CE credits you will receive today to be, for being on the webinar. Now I would like to introduce our speaker today, Lisa Friedman. Uh, Lisa is an LMFT and she has a private practice in Newport Beach, California. She specializes in treating individuals who are suffering with eating disorders. Currently, she is in the process of publishing her memoir called Freedom from Food, Memoirs of a Survivor from Anorexia and Bulimia. She believes that it is her passion in life to help individuals who are still suffering with eating disorders to recover and lead successful lives. She did her undergrad from UCSD in sociology, specializing in healthcare, social issues, and science. And she later went on to receive her master's degree from National University in Psychological Counseling. Welcome, Lisa. It's an honor and a privilege to have you as our speaker today. Thank you, Christine. You're welcome. Okay. I'd um, like to start out by telling you a little bit about my journey, how I got anorexia and bulimia, and um, my journey through the eating disorder. I was not born with anorexia and bulimia, and God only knows I never wanted any part of an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget one significant day that led me to begin practicing that living road of hell, which led me to my eating disorder, though. Um, let me give you a little history on my relationship with my family to help you understand that one event that occurred which propelled me into a life of restriction and why it affected me so deeply. The majority of my life I was sad. I was trained to be that way by my family. My mother still jokes with me today that she called me Miss Misery when I was an infant. I still don't find um, how she finds that humorous. I have one brother who's 16 months younger than me, and as a very young child, we were really close. Um, we played with our puppy together, our turtles together, um, we played on the piano. We had a great time together. And then um, life got in the way, and um, everything changed drastically. My brother was a big handful for my parents, and back then he had what everyone labeled as hyperactive. My mother and father were constantly taking him to um, doctors and therapists trying to, what they called, fix him. He couldn't sit still, and as a result, he was constantly getting injured, um, taking trips to the ER constantly. He ripped off his toe, put a hole in his hand, ripped off part of his nose, and tons of other incidences. So I kind of faded into the background, and he took center stage. My brother did poorly in school, and he lied a lot. Um, and my parents had this um, really violent tendency. Um, if it wasn't a major incident, um, my father, and my father wasn't around, um, we'd get off real easy by just having my mother pull our hair. But if it was a big incident, my father would just beat us. Um, my father had this look that came close to killing, so other than being beaten, he scared the shit out of us, too. We saw it a lot at the dinner table, so food became a real big issue. Um, 
if you ate soup too loudly or chewed with your mouth open, played with your utensils, picked at your food, basically did anything childlike behavior was good enough to warrant the look. Or if you were lucky, my mom and dad would both start arguing with each other over whether you deserve such treatment and whether you should be beaten after dinner. Every evening we had to eat together, and there was always an argument, and I would always cringe in terror. I just wanted them to stop, but they never did, and I wanted to disappear. My brother was the opposite of me, though. He egged them on, didn't follow the rules, talked back to them, and um, I just stopped getting along with him. Um, I looked up to my dad, though because he appreciated me because I wasn't egging them on. I tried to be perfect and he left me alone. We had this tacit understanding. If you don't bother me, I won't bother you. And, um, he, and my brother did the opposite. He just constantly got beaten. Even though I felt like my brother did many things wrong and deserved punishment, it frightened me to see the violence so frequently. Um, my mother favored my brother, though, and um, she would constantly protect him from my dad. In doing so, she would scream at my dad, why don't you beat her too, which meant me, of course, regardless of the fact that I didn't do anything wrong. Um, I was my father's, and my brother was my mother's, and that's just the way it was. My mother tried to live through me. She was brought up in an abusive family and never experienced any of the pleasures in life. Therefore, she got the idea that I would do all the things that she never did. In addition, because she was giving these things to me, these treats, she believed she was a good mother, and it made up for anything else she did or said to me. I was enrolled in the gymnastics team from 4 to 15 years old. I took piano lessons, ballet, and Sunday school. All the things my mom wanted to do, but didn't get the opportunity to. She would buy me the latest toys, new clothes, whatever I needed. But there was a catch. I was supposed to be indebted to her for the rest of my life. Weeks after she bought me something, if I did something wrong, she would say, Look what I gave to you, and this is the way you treat me? Life was unpredictable. I didn't know it then, but I found out my mother was alcoholic. I started having limited amounts of friends. I would get angry with them when they disappointed me, and I would cut them out of my life. I cried a lot, and I was afraid of making any mistake. Everything had to be done perfectly or not done at all. And that way, I would decrease my chance of being criticized. I became very self-conscious and afraid. My mom had total control over me, how I should act, how I should think, when I was being ridiculous, selfish, mean, or how I should or shouldn't eat, and what I should like and dislike. When other kids picked on me, she blamed me. Everything seemed to be my fault, and I pulled further and further away. I, yell, I got yelled at for crying and was screamed, I'll give you a reason to cry. I can't remember if I was beaten at that time or not. I began to block it all out. From the outside, my family looked perfect. We took vacations, visited my grandparents, spent summers in the Adirondacks with my grandparents, a nice Jewish family, well-liked, well-known. So here's how the eating disorder began. Other than my prime upbringing, which led me to have zero self-esteem, my mom did the favor one time of while shopping for clothes and telling me if I gained any more weight that she would have to take me to the Fat People Clothing Store. But that wasn't the incident. The next family, family thing that happened was we all went on a diet. We had to pee on sticks to check our ketones every day. That meant we had protein in our urine. Everyone on, went on the diet except my brother. His weight was deemed okay. 
the diet became a competition of who could lose the weight the fastest. Realize this was a crack diet and I was only 12 years old in a crazy competition that was set me over the edge. The diet worked. I lost weight. And my brother, who had hated me all this time, stood in the bathroom one day and said, Wow, Lisa, you really look good. With these words from someone who never said anything nice to me, my eating disorder began. If I could control my weight, I felt more in control of my life than I ever had. And with that, the eating disorder began. From that day on, I was off on diets, um, losing weight, gaining weight, up and down the scales constantly. And um, eventually, when I got into college, my weight skyrocketed way up till I wore a size 18. Um, I was going on binges where I'd eat 10,000 calories in a matter of a half an hour and then pass out on the bed just completely exhausted. And that would go on. I'd go home, visit my parents. They would scream at me for being like, how the hell did you get to be like this? And I didn't know. And so then I'd go on another crazy diet, lose the weight within a month, and and do it all over again. Uh, I just felt completely out of control. I had gotten a job, and um, one day um, they had seen that I had started eating rituals where I would only eat certain foods. At the time, I had chosen it to be popcorn, and I would only eat popcorn in little tiny balls. So. Um, my coworkers were concerned about me. They locked me in a room, and uh, they all guarded the door and said, you either go into treatment or you're getting fired. So I broke through the door, ran to a payphone, called my father to come and get me, which he did. But we went back to my office, talked to them, and of course, my insurance didn't cover any treatment. If it had been alcohol or drugs, it would have covered it, but not an eating disorder. So I took out all my savings account, paid for a treatment center, went into the treatment, and that's where I learned to become bulimic. And with that, I was able to go back to work and fool everybody. They were like, oh, she's eating. So. Uh, that's where my bulimia started, <laughs> and years went on where I started throwing up in garbage cans, trash bags, eating hundreds of dollars worth of food every day, and just getting so sick. Every time I stood up, I'd pass out, and my hair was falling out. I was purging so hard, and my eyes were turning bright red. I was in the hospital every week for low potassium on the verge of having a heart attack. I just couldn't stop. I wanted to stop. I didn't know what was happening to me. I just felt insane all the time. Um, I go, again, my parents would get me into treatment centers. I'd gain the weight back. I'd come out and immediately start doing over my behaviors again. This went on for so many years, um, five years, then ten years, it just kept going on and on. Um, my parents disowned me. I, I still kept doing it. I moved to the East Coast. I was doing it there. And then I moved back to California. I finally found a doctor who didn't give up on me. and. Um, that was one of the uh, special days of, um, of my getting into recovery. No matter how far down you fall, there is always hope for recovery. And you need to find somebody who is willing to stand by you. And now, as a therapist, I am that person for everybody who walks into my door. 
um, I never turn away somebody, no matter how far down they come. Um, so, um, first when somebody comes into my office, I first and foremost um, form a unconditional um, bond with them. It's not so much about um, what the disease has done to them or how they're going to get better, but letting that individual know that somebody cares about them no matter what, no matter what they've done and no matter where this road's going to take them, that I will be there for them no matter what. And letting them know that I've been there and I understand that. And my patients, um, my patients understand that I know where they are and they feel that. And that's a gift that I give to them. Okay. Um, the second thing that I teach them is that um, most people with eating disorders feel that they are bad and um, they are their disease. And that's absolutely not the truth. Their behavior is what needs to change. They are not their behavior. Um, they're acting on their thoughts and their emotions. And their thoughts and their emotions are, um, can be changed. And they're really, what they're acting on is their feelings, painful feelings, that they've used the food to cover up those feelings with. And um, the process of recovery is teaching them how to um, feel the feelings and sit with them. And that's, um, that's a process that takes time. And it's not an easy process at all. And it's not a quick fix. And I'm really straightforward with um, individuals who come in. That they're not going to come in and get a magic wand. And that's what they're hoping for. And they may do a lot of um, therapy or doctor shopping looking for that quick fix. But um, that when they come in, they need to be ready to do some work and that. I can give them the simple techniques that are going to get them into recovery, but putting those techniques into practice is hard, hard work. It's the most rewarding work that they'll ever do, but they need to do it, and they need to do it more than once, more than twice, more than three times, more than four times. And it usually takes a good year of doing it before they're going to get themselves into some good recovery. Um, the eating disorder is, most eating disorder clients come in and they think it's all about the food. And that's absolutely not what it's about. And family members come in also trying to bring their son or their daughter in saying that, you know, my son or daughter has a problem with food, and that's not the truth, and I have to educate them. A big part of this is education, that I know they're using food to cover up their feelings. And it's just like any addiction. Um, the addiction is not the problem. It's the feelings that you're not dealing with, but that's the problem. And it's not really um, so much a fault or to blame that you've done. It's you grew up in an environment that wasn't healthy. You weren't taught an appropriate way to handle your feelings. If you had been, you wouldn't have got to the place you're at right now. But it is what it is. And now we have to teach you how to reparent yourself. And so, are you willing to do that? 
because if you're not, you're not going to progress past where you are. So you've got to get the idea that food is the issue out of your head. And you've got to let that go. And with an eating disorder, it's really, really complex because you've got to deal with the food minimum three times a day, which makes it really stressful because eating disorder people do not want to eat. It brings up those feelings constantly and you've got to learn how to cope with them. So no, it's not about the food, but you have to face the fear of the food three times a day at least and get through the feelings that are associated with them. Okay, there's a lot of resistance <laughs> um, because of the association um, with these clients. These clients have a lot of um, uh, built up um, thoughts that are uh, not realistic in, in their uh, thought processes. And um, there's a lot of reality testing that needs to go on and getting the individual to get out of black and white thinking that, that everything is all good or all bad. And you've got to get that individual to start looking at the middle of the road or living in the gray. And it's, it's a really hard process to go through. And it doesn't happen overnight. It, it is definitely a process. It's not an event. And it occurs over that individual's time not over the therapist's time, not over the family's time, and uh, it's very hard for that individual or the family to cope with. And again, that's why I, as a therapist, have to be really patient and always be there for that person, regardless of whether I see the change or not. Um, I have to sit with that person and be willing to let them do the work um, um, when they're ready to do it and just keep giving them encouragement and positive reinforcement and um, hoping that um, they will make the change. And, um, um, even when uh, you don't see the change in an individual, um, that doesn't mean that you're not doing the individual any good. As long as you're putting ideas in this person's head, you can be planting the seed for down uh, the road in later time. I had a um, doctor a long time ago, early, early into my illness. Um, it was... Um, one day I went in to see her. She was just my regular GP. And I had gone in to see her, and she made me stand on the scale. And this was when I wasn't uh, looking at the scale when I went in to see her. And she made me get on the scale, and I turned backwards so I couldn't see. And she said, Lisa, you lost 10 pounds this week. And I couldn't argue with her because I didn't know what I had weighed the week before. And I was like, in my head, I was saying, there's no way. I don't lose weight. I, this, she has to be lying. There's no way. And her response was to me, um, come with me. And this was the middle of her practice day. She took me out the back of her office, and we went in her car, and she drove me to a lake. And we got out, and we walked around the lake for about a half an hour just talking about what I was going through in my life and how I was really in the depths of my um, disorder. And at the end of our conversation, she said, are you ready to go in the hospital now? And I said, I'm willing to do anything you tell me to do right now. Just because she had um, been willing 
to just listen to me and be there for me, something that nobody ever in my entire life had ever done for me. And so just the fact that somebody had been there for me and waited and waited and waited and just um, just been there. It hadn't done anything special, just been there. Um, I found that so amazing. She never saw me recover, but um, she planted a seed in my recovery that I will never, ever forget. And that means more to me than, than anything most people had ever done for me. And so when you're helping treat other individuals, you can plant a seed. You may never see that person recover, but that doesn't mean you're not doing a heck of a lot of good in that person's life. Okay, so um, the other thing, when I'm working with individuals, I talk a lot about um, coping techniques and um, one of the really important things that I have my clients do is write them down. Because when you're talking about dealing with the major things, anxiety and depression in eating disorders, when you're dealing with um, having them use coping techniques to deal with the anxiety and the depression, when a client is in the heat of the moment of anxiety and depression, for them to think of what you talked about in a session, they can't remember anything when they're anxious or depressed. So if you don't encourage them to write it down, either during your session, preferably so they walk out of there with a list, and continue to write down coping techniques, they're not going to be able to think of what you talked about during session, and they won't have anything to look back on. So please have your clients write things down so they have a list and post it to the bathroom mirror or wherever they go and look really often so that they have an actual list to look at. The same thing with affirmations, with daily affirmations. Mm -hmm. Have a running list so that they have something to look at. And, um, with affirmations, make them be believable. When somebody first walks into your office, um, don't start out with affirmations saying, like, look in the mirror and say, I love you. Somebody who is suicidal is not going to stand in the mirror and say, I love you, and have that work for them, because they're not in that space. Have somebody start out with something really small that they are going to believe, like, I'm trying to recover, so things will improve, or I'm doing the best that I can. So, to get back to coping techniques, I start out with um, the cognitive behavioral um, triangle. Are they going to be able to see you know, I don't know, but I did. Oh, okay. So we to do that. Sure. This is the cognitive behavioral triangle, and I draw this out for them and use it showing that thoughts, behavior, and feelings, which are emotions, are all connected to each other. And usually somebody with depression or anxiety is having negative thoughts about themselves, especially with eating disorders. And it leads to, when you have a negative thought, like, I feel fat, or I uh, life is hopeless, or um, I'm disgusting, or you ask them personally, what thoughts are you having that are negative? It leads to negative behavior, like restriction, or vomiting, or isolating, uh, whatever the behavior may be. And then the feelings are depression and hopelessness, helplessness. What you want to do is show them that if you change any one of these, since they're all connected, to a positive instead of a negative, since they're all connected, they will all change to a positive. Okay? The easiest ones to change are either a behavior or a thought. Okay, to change a thought, 
most people think is really hard to do, but the way to do it is to picture a stop sign in your head and either out loud, I encourage them to do it out loud, but some people may think you're crazy if you <laughs> do this, scream stop. And if you don't want to do that because of the embarrassment, then just picture it in your head, picture a stop sign and say stop in your head for that thought when you're having that negative thought of I'm horrible, okay, or I'm too fat, just stop. I'm not going to have that thought and change it to a positive thought like I'm doing the best that I can change it and then the behavior you're going to change the behavior get up and physically move do something else do something positive like go for a walk again you're going to do one of your positive coping techniques practice deep breathing do free writing Free writing is different than journaling. Journaling is like 9 a.m., I woke up, 10 o'clock, I had breakfast, 11 o'clock, I went to school. Free writing is just putting your pen to paper and writing whatever comes out. and You don't stop until you're done. It's getting the junk that's in you out of you. Okay? It's extremely helpful. And with free writing, you don't save it and read it later. You crush it up, burn it, throw it away, throw it down the toilet bowl, whatever you want. But just get rid of it. It's getting those feelings, those horrible feelings in you, out of you, and getting them gone. Coping techniques are used to get the feelings inside of you, out of you, and just rid of them. That is what the process of this is for. Okay. Other coping techniques that you can use are using music, um, calling a friend. Um, uh, one of the ones I use is a special place. Picking a special place in your mind. It can be real or imaginary. It's just for you to go and to relax. Um, and imagine the smells that you smell. See the things around you. Touch the things that are around you. Um, and you can do a visualization while you're there also. You can do it while you're at work. You can do it while you're at home. Nobody has to know that you're at your special place. But it's for you and you alone. So again, create the coping techniques that work for you make the list longer and longer and longer each week you should be adding to this list not just making a small one and the reason for that being is that number one deep breathing may work for you great the first six times that you use it and then on number seven it may not work and if that's the only coping technique that you have you're stuck um, the seventh time you use it. But if you have 20 techniques, then you have 19 other things to use. Okay, So that's why you want to make a list of uh, a lot of things, because then you have other things to use besides number one. All right, And uh, hopefully your therapist is always there for you to access as well. I make myself available 24-7 to my clients, so they, they can always call me. They don't, but I made, I made myself available nonetheless. Okay. Um, some of the reasons people have eating disorders. Eating disorders are um, all about control. People have them because they feel a sense of lack of control in their life, and this is a way that they have a control over something. It is a huge control issue. Like I said, it is not about the food. It is completely, totally about um, having a sense of control in life. And um, that is completely why it's not about the weight. Um, there are people with eating disorders that are overweight and underweight and perfectly normal weight. And um, they will come, individuals will come into you at perfectly normal weight and say, well, I'm normal weight, so I obviously don't have a problem with food. I just have a problem with dieting. That's, no. 
<laughs> if you obsess about food mm -hmm. and where you're going to get it and on and off the scale and putting your clothes in the, on and off 20 times a day and if your life has become unmanageable because of thoughts, then you do have an eating disorder. Okay. Wow, that was powerful. Thank you so okay. much for that. I, we, that was just, that was great. So thank you. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, how to participate, you obviously will need to sign up uh, through our continuing education program. You could always go to Solve Institute and you actually, this will be put up 48 to 72 hours after Lisa's presentation. And if you go to Solve Institute, uh, you will need to take a test and then you will earn the CE credits. So we definitely will have an email sent to you when you sign up. We have your email and all the information uh, will be there. And I wanted to see if we had any questions. Let's see. I'll be getting <laughs> questions. So I had a question for you since I was listening to everything. Go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> so is your family supportive now? Um they try to be in their own way. My mother is still, my mother is still exactly the way she was to create me, so she just doesn't get it, you right. know? And I think that's one of the things they really have to understand um, and come to a point when you're dealing with this with your family is that they just may not understand what you're going through. And, and part of this is that you want to create your family into uh, a, a loving, supporting family and want them to be what everybody wants your family to be. Right. But there just comes a time when you have to accept them for what they are and they're just not going to be that. And, you know, um, my family is not going to be that. Right. And. That doesn't, I haven't cut them out of my life. Right. You You've know? accepted it. Yeah. <laughs> You've accepted who they are and. I right. And, and what they can be and what they can't be. I understand that. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I loved your story about the lake and a therapist who just took time to care. And that's really, you know, I always say this, we just want to matter in life. And it showed that you mattered to her. Absolutely. So I love that. And what do you think, we kind of talked about what your low was, but when enough became enough, when you, I guess, surrendered, how every day do you stay surrendered to this disease? Oh, I, well, because I've had relapses. Okay. And so I know that uh, I can't say that I can do this just one time because I've done it just one time okay. and it's never been just one time. Of course. It's like throwing me full back into the disease. Alcoholism addiction, it's like that. Yeah. Yeah. So there's just not one time for me. And so I just. I have to remind myself that I'm just as sick as my mind is. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And we're actually getting a uh, question. Uh, someone asked, how do you work through the resistance with eating disorder clients? That's one of the hardest things, and I'm just really supportive with them. I'm, I stay with them on their level and let them know that, you know, I know the processes that work and right. doesn't work, but it's truly up to them on whether they're going to take the steps. Mm. I'm going to be here for them regardless of whether they take the steps or not. Mm -hmm. um, there is a point where... Um, I'll always be supportive of them, but there is a medical stance mm -hmm. where I do have to take action, you know, and I am straightforward with them about that. So once you go below this point, um, we do have to take medical necessities mm -hmm. into consideration. Mm -hmm. But as far as me being um, a support system for them, I'll always be there. Okay. Regardless. Sure. Um, Great answer. Margaret had a question. What do you think about 12-step 
programs for eating disorders? And if you support that approach, how does relying on your higher power and being in the uh, present uh, with working uh, through or through the past uh, via reparenting, et cetera? That's an excellent question. Mm -hmm. And I encourage every one of my patients to be involved in the OA um, meetings because I think support groups are awesome. I think they give something that individual therapy cannot offer. Mm -hmm. And in addition to the 12 step, I also run uh, ANAT groups in once a month, um, which is not 12 step, but it also offers the group. So we do that in the office once a month. We offer it to the eating disorder. Um, and we also uh, offer group therapy for families. So mm -hmm. once a month we have at the same time, we run a family group and an eating disorder group, and I also encourage every single one of them to go to OA, which is 12 step. Um, and I keep reiterating it, even though they may be very resistant to it. I say, if you don't like the first group that you go to, try another one. They're all different, and they all have different focus. One may be a book group, one may be a speaker group, one may be a leader group. Try them because Every one of them has something to offer you. You mm -hmm. may not like some of it, but they all have something to offer. Okay, that makes sense. And Paula, I uh, had a question. She basically asked a similar question. She said, thank you for this presentation. I believe I gained a lot of insight. What are some of the ways that you respond to client resistance? So, um, you know, I'm... <laughs> I have a lot of compassion mm -hmm. because I've been there, a mm -hmm. lot of it, and, but I am straightforward with them, and um, as far as I'm asking them uh, what is keeping you from um, moving forward, and um, what are your biggest fears, mm. and, and I also, um, I also let them know right off from the straight um, out of the mm -hmm. gate that I'm not, my goal is not to make you gain weight. Right. I don't want you to gain weight. You know, look, mm -hmm. look at me. Mm -hmm. I'm not overweight. I don't want you to be overweight. Mm -hmm. I just want you to be, healthy. reach your goal. Mm -hmm. Not even healthy because the word healthy to an eating disorder person huh. terrifies them. Interesting. It, it, it really does. Healthy means fat to an oh, eating disorder interesting. person. Interesting. Okay. So I don't say healthy to them mm. because they'll go, oh, okay. and I know that because I've been like that. Don't make me healthy. Oh. Um, so uh, I don't even go there. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> so I just say I want you to help you um, reach your goals in life. Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay. So that it uses you have to be real specific, and the only reason I know that is because I've been there. Right. So it's different than having just a therapist. This is somebody who's been there and done that, right. you know? Okay, that makes sense. Uh, Deborah asked a great question. What five coping mecha mechanisms worked best for you? Um, I'll tell you, uh, the CBT triangle really worked for me, but I'll tell you, I was real resistant to it. It had to take me a real long time to learn how to work it. And then uh, the deep breathing was fantastic because I had an awful lot of anxiety, terrible, terrible anxiety. And you cannot have a panic attack when you're using the deep breathing. It's, it's just impossible. Hmm. So it, it's, uh, it's fantastic to use. Um, and the writing and exercise decreases. Now, with an eating disorder, especially an anorexic, you have to be very careful with the exercise. So when I'm encouraging any type of exercise, it's, okay, I want you to take a five-minute brisk walk around the block. No more than that, okay? Because you don't want them to trade off disorders um, because I would find myself at points going to the gym for an hour in the morning and then an hour in the afternoon and then an hour in the evening and um, and that was just 
another mm -hmm. form of bulimia. Mm -hmm. So um, you have to be really careful of that. Too. Okay, and we good. And we have one more question and then we have to end. Unfortunately, I've been very educated this hour. <laughs> uh, another one by Margaret. Do you see a connection between other types of self-harm examples, cutting, scratching, yeah. and yes, eating disorder? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. it's real big. The cutting and the scratching is really big and it's becoming unfortunately more popular. Mm -hmm. um, it is. Mm -hmm. It is. It's mm -hmm. very big. Um, and yeah. she wanted to know how you would treat that. Do you deal with cutting, scratching, and how would you treat that? Yeah, it's, I do treat it. Um, it's really associated with personality disorder, so you approach it in the same way you approach okay. a personality disorder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. It's more managing symptoms than uh, it's very different than anxiety or depression. Huh. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Well, thank you again, Lisa. It was great. I really learned <laughs> thank a lot. You. Thank you. So did I. So did I. And uh, we will end the webinar now, but you can also write to us if you had any more questions or you wanted to reach out to Lisa Friedman. So you could write us at CEU at SOV Health dot com and again you will be earning your CE credits after you go to sawinstitute.com and take the test. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.